Hey everybody, I just wanted to start this episode with a brief preface. We recently moved into a new recording space and discovered after the fact that directly beneath us there are several bands that like to practice at very irregular hours, but often while we've been trying to record episodes. For the most part, we've been able to mitigate any sound interference on our recordings, but on this episode, it escalated to a level that we really weren't able to deal with, and so we've had to split our recording into two sessions. You'll notice a bass comes in partway through the episode and then very suddenly cuts out, as well as a more substantial cut right around 50 minutes, which is when we took a break for the day. And unfortunately, Brant was not able to be with us for our second session and was not able to give his recommendation for this week. So I just wanted to acknowledge the issue and let everybody know what's going on with this episode. We're going to take steps to make sure that this hasn't happened again in the future. And in the meantime, please enjoy View from the Gutters, episode 151. Welcome to View from the Gutters, the comic book podcast where each episode we discuss a collected edition, trade paperback, or graphic novel, and then recommend and vote on the book for the next episode. Warning, the discussion portion of this show has massive spoilers for that book. On this episode, we discuss Odyssey by Matt Fraction and Christian Ward. Thank you to all of our Patreon sponsors for contributing to the show and especially to this week's episode sponsor, Beckin Lewandowski. To skip ahead to the recommendation section, skip to one hour and two minutes. All right, well, welcome to View from the Gutters, episode 151. Bum, yeah! Bum. Second mm-hmm. century and a half. I'm Tobias Panchin. I'm Joe Pretty. I'm Kit DeForge. I'm Kaylee Fleeman. Brant Gillahan Eddy. And welcome once again to the shit. Yes. And we are well down into it this week. Oh, God. Who who recommended this book? It was Joe. It's Joe's fault we're here. Blame him. Mm -hmm. I do that What, this isn't a fucking whimsical trip for you motherfuckers? What are you talking about? This is a night afternoon reading. Whimsical fuckery. Whimsical. Whimsical. I hate all of you so much. What? Right now. What am I doing? I've starting... not been doing anything. You're just being polite and making eye contact with me while I'm talking, and I'm talking that way because Damn. everybody gives me shit when I don't talk into my microphone. Let me amend that. Brant, I love you very much. Yay! Yes. Everyone else, I'm just death lasers. Just just flames coming out of my brain and stabbing all of you. Yeah, that's all right. Yeah. Jealousy Blames. burns. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I would say that we don't deserve this kind of treatment. Blames I'd say I deserve side. a gold trophy. <laughs> a gold I already star. gave you three yeah. trophies. That's not true. That is so that's true. That's actually somewhat true. I gave you a pimp <laughs> cup, which is worth three trophies. Yeah, but that's basically mine anyway. St- I was entitled that the standard to it. Going I'm right entitled for a pimp as fuck. Cup, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes, it is. I'm going to throw up a picture of that pimp cup too. It's an extreme So treat. everybody can see how pimp you are. Yeah, well, I already know that. So. Assuring others is really our duty, I guess. So, assuring, <laughs> assuring others is our duty. Yeah, that's the new tagline for the show. Mm-hmm. Is, is that what it is? Yeah, assuring yeah. others is our duty. <laughs> Fuck. All right. Well, this week we're here to talk about Odyssey and bump our microphones. Bump. My microphone. <laughs> this week we're here. To t- you know what? I'm just going to wait. Until you get <laughs> but, I'm sorry. I'm you, really you need don't. my keys, Joe? You need my keys? <laughs> you want to jingle some on? fucking Yeah, keys? can I use them to stab myself through my eye and into my fucking brain? Ah, you need to. I'm sorry. You only need one well. eye. I cannot. I've been sick for like 10 goddamn days. It's ridiculous. All right. This week we're talking about Odyssey yes. by Matt Fraction and Christian Ward. And Joe, you pitched this book to us. Yes. Why would you do that to us? Well, first off, I want to say that I say it in my head, Odyssey, like it rhymes with Jodeci. Yeah. I'm... That's not a word? <laughs> Jodeci yeah, was a band in the 80s, so mm-hmm. step off. Yeah. I almost called you grandpa, but then yeah. I realized wow. I was the one checking Jodeci. the 80s. 
he, she, we, Odyssey. Are you sure you're not Odyssey. about yeah. Journey and Odyssey? Hunting. No, I am sure I'm not talking about Don't that. Don't stop believing. Because, so we get into the space today and there's a punk band playing. And Toby's like, well, it's the same band that was playing last time. And I'm like, no, it's clearly not. It's a completely different style of music. So we know that, like... Kaylee no. knows whether or not punk is dead, and that's God. <laughs> oh, I you should know. ask her. Yay! I, I'm sorry. I'm going to derail this. I'm going to pull a Joe Pretty. <laughs> uh, so I was telling Kit today the angriest I have ever been in my entire life. Like I have never felt so alive as I did in this moment. Was when I was 14 years old, and I went to some shitty Christian rock concert. At the time, I thought it was great. But the band that one of the bands I was there to see after their set yells into their microphone, punk is dead, long live post punk. And I started screaming at them like, get off the fucking stage. I was so mad and angry. And I had like my like a Ramones bandana, Misfits shirt on. And I just have never felt so alive in my life. And I don't think I will ever reach a point of just purity like that and it was beautiful it was a beautiful moment for me also the moment i stopped listening to christian rock okay probably wasn't it christian post-punk christian post-punk yeah (laughs) (laughs) christian post-punk you gotta be specific about that shit christian Um, grindcore the way to go um i just want to say i was into christian punk before it was cool Mm. So you still I, have um, time then. I does, right? <laughs> Everyone else still, still, still waiting. Time. Still waiting. Um, so I I picked Odyssey because I had only read the first issue and I wanted other people to read it with me because I had no. So like I did not. Uh, my my taste in novels ran towards Stephen King and much more kind of pop literature. I never read the classics. I was never that interested in, um, you know, like any of that stuff. So, um, my, I mean, I'm, I'm familiar with, uh, the Odyssey as like this mythological construct, but I've, you know, only kind of through the filter of other people writing about it. So I, I wanted to kind of, I knew that it was going to be something that I read or I felt that it was going to be something that I was going to, that I read that I wanted to talk to other people about. And since you guys are the only people that will talk about comics with me, I figured I'd just ask you guys. Wow. (laughs) No, I'm just kidding. Kaylee and I were wondering why we didn't just watch Oh Brother Where Art Thou instead. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, I we all would have um, been happy. I'm not going to lie. That was a much more enjoyable experience, but it was largely because of George Clooney. It was just so charming. Yeah, that's true. It's just that whole movie. That movie is great. But it's the Coen brothers. Yeah. And one thing about the Coen brothers is that they can do like quirky and fun, but then they can also do quirky and fun. And oh my God, did he just stuff that guy into a wood chipper? That's fucking awful. Now this Mm -hmm. isn't quirky and funny anymore. Oh, wait. Yeah, it is. (laughs) It is when he doesn't go in so easily. Yeah, (laughs) God. Oh, that scene. (laughs) So I... Basically, I I chose it because I was inter- I knew that I'd be interested in talking about it, and um, after reading it, I am because I have lots of feelings, but I don't necessarily know. I'll say this: I think Matt Fraction is um, very talented. I think that he has been a vanguard of this. Kind of, I don't know if you want to call it a renaissance. You know, some people are certainly calling it a renaissance of comics. Some people are calling it a new golden age of comics. But this age of comics, I believe that Matt Fraction will will not only be associated with, but he'll be one of the champions of this age of comics. And so, and even for somebody of that stature in the comics community, doing this, I feel, is ambitious because. This does not lend itself well to, I I don't necessarily know that the Odyssey is something that lends itself well to modern storytelling in general, uh, much less doing an an entirely like gender swapped craziness that I think totally, I think works within the confines of the story, but I just, 
this took chutzpah, you know. I think mm-hmm. I, I don't think this was something he just woke up and was like, oh, I think I'll retell the Odyssey today. Nope, mm-hmm. pancakes for breakfast, sure. Mm-hmm. You know, so what did, I'm interested to hear what you guys thought about it though. So I um my I I want to preface this by saying I have a lot of high regard for Matt Fraction. So I have a lot of high regard for Christian Ward and I think his art is fantastic and I think Matt Fraction's writing is beautiful however (laughs) in this book in particular which i feel like is i I might end up critiquing this book harsher than how i mean i guess uh uh, how i say it welcome to my world but um (laughs) galaxy in this in this case it doesn't really make sense i guess that's my biggest problem with this book when it starts and uh and there are a number of reasons for that um and i felt like after i was done reading this i knew less about the odyssey than i did when i went in um and i think that there are there's a number of major reasons for that one the writing is very much so in the style of the original Odyssey, right? Like very much so basically what Homer put down, uh, just translated, um, which is fine. Like that's not a bad thing in its own. And the art is very demanding of its viewer, which is fine on its own. However, when you have very uh, cryptic and not, concise text and you have art that is incredibly demanding and then you also are flipping the story to be a gender bent sci-fi retelling with weird extra things thrown in to make it more sci-fi to make things more complex it muddles everything up and I think this book would have been done I don't want to say better because it doesn't, it, it would have been written clearer if either the text was written in a modern, concise way with clear and simple language and the art stayed exactly the same, or if the <coughs> art was clearer and more sequential, I guess, and the text was kept exactly the same. But having both of that exactly how it was made it incredibly hard to follow. And as one of very few times that I have felt that sorority white girl moment where I closed the book <laughs> and went, I'm confused. I don't get it. I don't <laughs> get it. This book feels incredibly, this, this book is of two worlds and it definitely reads as if it is. I feel like he's going for a fusion because I feel like his setup and his narration is very much in a classic style, but the dialogue is a much more modern dialogue. But because of that, I never feel like I have any real grounding. And I feel the same way about the art. At some points, it's incredibly detailed and like, um, and, you know, I'm trying to pick things out of it. And then other parts, it feels incredibly loose and like, um and and watery and like i can't really grasp anything and it just feels like it's very it, it feels like it has one step in this very classic story and one step in this very modern story and because of that it's kind of pissing all over everything yeah at case in point we've got we've got this bit here where artemis uh shows up and i think what like the fourth or fifth chapter issue yeah, what I think have it's you the fifth. and we've got this no, panel yeah. here after the complete madness of like a lot of this narration that takes artemis and one panel is see how they run which is you know really kind of flowery and then right after is fuck i love this i fucking love popping these little cunts like balloons yeah and i'm like well okay which are you trying to do like again i I feel like that adds to a sense of general discord and what's happening is that if you have this really lyrical kind of narration and then you just pop into this extremely modern sounding Vulgar, speech modern, yes. and then right back into that flowery shit, like right after, I don't understand 
I don't understand why there wasn't stricter decision making in terms of that because yeah. it would be one thing if even that was consistent like the dialogue was consistently modern but it vacillates yeah so often that i'm kind of like well what are you doing here you well, know i feel you know what it makes me think of it's like if bosler if you're watching Bos lerman's romeo and juliet and john leguizamo was just like playing himself yeah yeah that's how it <laughs> yeah. feels i both agree and disagree with a lot of what you're saying <laughs> It's it's amusing that you use that terminology. <laughs> How so? Are you of two minds about this subject? Yeah, yeah, I am. <laughs> oh my. Um, no. Uh, on the one hand, it is an incomplete adaptation. You know, the the Odyssey takes place in a place at a time and the story is predicated on it being in that place in that time in this mythic setting and fractions exportation of that to some future time in outer space in a reality where no men exist doesn't a hundred percent work i think that there are you know i mean at least so far the presence of the gods is not really explained in any science fictional sense as to what they are or what they do or how they operate except hey it's it's all the ancient greek gods and they exist in outer space and poseidon is the god of space as metaphor for sea and he kills off all the men but then he replaces them with female not men that fill the same role as men well, sort uh, of uh, promethea did that yeah well he being fraction as the creator of this conceptual oh, space right. Um, and I don't feel like that quite hangs together. It's, it's a strained metaphor. On the other hand, this reminds me both of Ron Wimberley's Prince of Cats, which is a Shakespeare adaptation that does the same thing of being in this very archaic language and then very violently going into modern vernacular and back again, which I really enjoy in that book. Um. It also reminds me a lot of Brandon Graham's Prophet, uh, just in terms of style and tone and it being this like really weird, really strange future with all this like bioorganic tech and aliens and shift ships and just craziness. And I really dig on all of that stuff. And I really dig Christian Ward's art and how challenging it is. I think that that is a strength of the work rather than a liability. So I'm I'm kind of half on the same page with you and half not. Well, and that that was kind of my my point, I guess, is that I am on board with Fractions writing, and I am on board with Christian Ward's art. I don't know if I'm on board with the two of them together because it makes it too too dense, and it's it's too lofty. I think, uh, for for a clear read and i don't i don't know what is trying to be accomplished in this story i guess which is which is kind of my my rough point and there are a lot of reviews on goodread that summed up my feelings perfectly which is wow i really enjoyed this i will not be getting volume two yeah. And it's like, yeah, like I, I really love the art. Like I want printings of just about every single panel in here. I really love the writing. I think it's great. And I actually do um, with like the modernization, you have to remember that there were insults that were hurled in the Odyssey that were much more vulgar when they were written. And so the idea of being like, oh, these fucking whores and cunts and blah, da 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 it's the same level, which is why it's to us so egregious. Like you have to update that language and I get it. It seems silly to me to be willing to change so much about the Odyssey, but then be so staunch on keeping with the language and not updating it in a way that would make it flow with its universe better. Uh, it just seems to be dissonant. Kid, go. I I think the problem that I have with 
the writing is that to me it feels more like an attempt to assure than it does an attempt to retell. I think that in a lot of senses it feels a little bit to me like they're trying to assure you that they're taking from this epic work, I guess, or that they're inspired by this epic work. And it it feels like because they're willing to go so many other directions, like you said, with, with art and with design and, and with world building, I guess you'd say, um, that it's almost like they're not sure you're going to get that it's the Odyssey. And even though, I mean, you may have it in the title and everything else like that, I feel like, I, I hate to be that guy that says trying too hard, but I feel like it's trying too hard to assure you of what it is. Where I feel like a little more confidence could have made this a little different, you know? And I think w we went to Taco Truck the other day and you were talking to me about this book right after I bought it um, from the comic shop. Do you remember what you said about, you know, Matt talking to Kelly Sue about retelling this? Oh, yeah. Uh, at a, a panel that I was at, I I say a lot of things, so I might not repeat the thing that you want me to repeat. But I'll try. I only hear half of them, so that oh, works that's out. good. Um, <laughs> at the panel that I was at, Matt Fraction was discussing Odyssey. At the time, it had not come out yet as its first issue, uh, and he was discussing some of the troubles that he was having with it and how how much of a toll this work was taking on him. And Kelly turns to him and she's like, well, yeah, you're trying to adapt the fucking Odyssey. Like, you don't need to make it better or improve upon it because it's the Odyssey. And it was kind of like this offhanded, like, joke of, like, you know, you work yourself too hard. And I think in some ways the fear of failure might have hurt this book. And I again want to repeat that does not mean my my critiques of this book do not mean that it is a bad book or that it has failed it's simply i do like a lot about it and because i like a lot about it i'm able to nitpick certain things <clears throat> if it was bad i would probably just be like it's bad it's just straight up bad and then wouldn't have much else to say so that's kind of my my stance on it. I enjoyed this. I enjoyed the writing. I enjoyed the art. I don't know if it's necessarily my cup of tea, which makes it hard. Um, and I do think it failed in some regards. Yeah, I, I feel the opposite. I don't feel that there's any uncertainty in this. I think it feels to me reading this that Fraction knows exactly what he wants to do. And it's very much like you're going to have to keep up with me. Otherwise you're just going to get bogged down in it. Like this is what we're doing. This is how I'm going to do it. Let's go. And it just, it feels, and I think I say that is because I've seen other, I'm thinking of the Tim Seeley book we read that I didn't really care for. Um, Oh, um, you know, the one I'm talking about Re blue alien revival and... revival. Yeah. And how mm. that kind of felt, mm, a little wishy-washy to me and there's i i don't detect any wishy-washiness in this i i detect that fraction sat down and was like okay this is what i want to do this is how i'm going to do it and and just kind of ran with it and i think i i find myself wondering if it's supposed to have that feel because i agree with you like there's a lot of this that disparately i'm very into i wonder if it's supposed to have this kind of duality to it because if you look at you have these very concrete things that are going on but then you have the gods who are not concrete they're very they are ephemeral and ethereal and they shift and they are of you know they are all gendered and they are kind of their their alliances are constantly shifting and they're forming things against each other and so it definitely feels that there's a purpose there. I just, I, I wonder if the problem was not the book, but the fact that there's not enough of it yet. That maybe as it comes together, it'll be a little bit more solidified. 
uh, I, I see Brant shaking his head, and I'm I'm waiting for him to weigh in on, the, on this conversation because I know he and I have talked about the Greek classics before, the Odyssey and the Medea and all of that. So I'm very eager to hear your thoughts, Brant. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so let's see. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Let me start with two things. So there's an inconsistency towards art that I'm not sh- if in certain c- circumstances. I think it's intentional. Earlier today when I was thinking about it, I, I was going to chalk it up to some, just kind of being you know, too rushed or too whatever, but I think it's actually in keeping with the entire tone of the book. I don't think the series is going to end and it's going to feel any less or any more solid. So I, I agree. One of the one of the things that you know, even from the first issue of, of as as far as how image and you know, I would assume by extension Ward and Fraction marketed this book was talking about it in the realm of being psychedelic, right? Which yes, it's about the expansion of consciousness. So I think that there's there's a couple of things happening here. I think the fractions very intentionally and Ward by extension also are pulling on some very specific imagery and tropes and concepts that were present through science fiction in the 60s and 70s. I think they're obviously pulling from the Greek myth aspects of it. Um, And of course, the whole thing with the Odyssey, which is considered kind of interesting, or not the only thing, but one of it is it starts uh, um, in mens reas or what have you. Uh, It starts in the middle, right? In mens rea. rea. Or in media res. In media res, yeah. Excuse me. So yeah, it starts in the middle. You don't, you know, you have, you don't have context. (laughs) Mens rea is the will to uh, commit uh, crime. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> or uh, will to wrongdoing, I think. Right. Yeah, thank you. Sorry. Which is an interesting uh, Freudian slip, I guess. Yeah. Um, so, I, so, I think, so I think that there's, I think there's both kind of this weird... So I, I think that there's an, an, an inherently planned discordance. And some of it is as much about what's missing as what's there. And some of it is about how it's represented and how it shifts. So for instance, within science fiction, generally you would want to explain why things exist, right? You're, you know, especially the harder of science fiction you go into, the less satisfying it is if things exist without explanation. Like gods, like what the fuck are gods doing here? But he's pulling from a myth, which is about this kind of, you know, and especially if you want to dive into Campbell and Jung and all that stuff, that's about consciousness beyond the concrete beyond the real um you know and to a certain extent they simply are they are forces of the great existence they are there they do their things they're capricious they're like people but they're not you know you can understand them but you can't and so i think this entire thing is meant to be basically a giant you know pendulum wrecking ball of the brain and the eyes i think that there is an attempt here to completely constantly keep you on your feet and off your guard not let you be settled specifically to make you expand your consciousness now you know we talked a lot last week about top 10 and i actually answered a listener today on our website in regards to that episode and i mentioned there and i'll say it now about you know i think one of the things we grapple with a lot is accessibility to art and how does an artist layer their work to create an environment where it feels accessible and is it good or bad or anything that an artist might create something that is more or less accessible to some or all or none. So I think that, you know, fraction is typically a relatively science minded writer. Although I think my critique of him in almost every single Avenue is that he's not actually that hard of a science fiction writer. He gets labeled science fiction a lot because of his themes, but not because of his method. He leaves a lot of things unanswered, and I think that that suits him fine. And that's, you know, fine by me as long as I walk into it with that recognition. Because sometimes I think I've gone into fraction stuff. We talked about this with sex criminals, where it's like half the stuff doesn't make sense or doesn't line up with itself well. And he may never care because it's about the ride and the bigger things that he's talking about. But I think in this work, it's. It seems to me pretty intentional that, um, you know, funny enough, I was not enjoying myself. I've read the Odyssey like a dozen times. I had, I was, you know, one of those people who had to do it a bunch in high school and I moved in the middle of high school. So I had to do it like three times and all this stuff. And, um, there's this, this build up and, uh, I believe it's Zeus who's talking and, you know, up until this moment, even the dialogue itself has been relatively 
um, consistent and um, I don't know if Baroque's the right word, but you know, kind of flourishy and older. And then, uh, you know, they're talking about, um, you know, he's like, I'm Zeus. I consigned my own daughter, the first of my generation of my offspring, etc. cetera. Nix, I'm Zeus. I said, no, I watched my daughter go mad. I did nothing. And then the last line, you know, the last little word bubble is she still found a way to fuck with me and mine, which is the first time. in, I mean, I think an issue, maybe an issue and a half where suddenly we break into that weird, like real world, hyper violent, like common colloquial speech. And I remember reading this and I was super tired and I was not into it. And I was just like, well, what, what? Like, because, yeah, I read a lot of psychedelic fiction. I've tried to dip my toe into that water more than once because I've had people, a really good friend of mine, she is super into this kind of literature that is anomalous and amorphous and you read it and it's about how you feel about reading it, not really about what's happening and like that kind of thing. And I kind of was reading this thinking that it was like a combination of Odyssey and that. And I'm like, Ugh, I do not want to do this for another four issues or whatever. And then Zeus was like, fuck with me and mine. I'm like, whoa, whoa, what? What? And then I felt like that was happening again and again and again for me where I was kind of like, oh, I'm slipping into classic mode. Oh, I'm slipping into weird like Quentin Tarantino, you know, I'm going to fucking blow your head off, man, type stuff. <laughs> and I, yeah, the more I think about it and the more I listen to you guys, I think it is successful for what it's attempting to do. I think it is exactly what they're trying to do. And I, you know, the thing that's interesting to me is we're, many of us here at the table, if not all of us, Many of our listeners um, maybe have a lot of experience with the Odyssey. Maybe even know that "Oh Brother, Where Art Thou" refers to the Odyssey, or that there are other things in media that have you know made use of that stuff. But I think there's also just as many readers out there now, depending on where they went to school or what their life was like, who have no idea what the Odyssey is. Maybe have heard about it tangentially, and this will be their first exposure to it mm-hmm. in a lot of ways. And so I can imagine how trippy as fuck this story would be. Not to mention all the stuff that Fraction flipped around. I have some social consciousness questions about why he chose to do some of that stuff. I always question, you know, when a guy comes in and is like, I'm going to make them all women, but they're all going to be hyper masculine and violent. I'm like, then really you're writing about men, Mm -hmm. right? Like, or at least the traditional model of man. And so like platonic ideal of masculine. Yeah. You know, and I think maybe to a certain extent he's trying to challenge that. Right. Or maybe he's not like, those are the things that I walk away from this. Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, so I'm supposed to feel uncomfortable the entire time. Am I supposed to feel as uncomfortable about it? Were you, you know, and I think I said this about sex criminals too. And this, I guess, is maybe my relationship with Matt Fraction's work is half the things I ask myself about his stuff, is he wanting me to ask myself or am I just noticing it because, but unlike some things, which I think you, Joe, were mentioning, I think you can pick up on some works and Kaylee made allusion to this too. Some things you can pick up, you can read and you'll be like, you have no idea what you're fucking talking about. Like, yeah. you writer have no clue. You're a fucking moron. Get the fuck out of my face. Fraction, I don't walk away with that level of certainty. I'm just like, did he want me to think about this? Or am I catching something that he hasn't thought all the way through? And is that bad that he hasn't covered it? You know, like, and whereas with sex criminals, that makes me upset because I really want things to line up in a very clean way with this i'm like well he clearly wants me to feel all weird and discombobulated about it so i guess i will yeah honestly i feel like you're clearing up some of the problems that i had with it and i think at the end of the day for me at the very least it's becoming clear that this is not necessarily a story about story it's not about telling the story of the odyssey if you want to hear the story of the odyssey you have your selection of titles this is about being experimental within the mainstream comic space and about a stream of consciousness experience to a certain extent, kind of the, the experiential quality of, of reading this and being there and not necessarily every I being dotted and every T being crossed as far as like, this is what all the things are. This is what they do. This is how they do it. This is the story arc of this particular character. Like, I think a lot of people, at least in broad outlines, know what the deal is with the Odyssey. Right. And they're not going, a plot twist that I didn't anticipate. What's going to happen now? It's like, oh my God, they're killing all these things and there's a giant. This is so colorful. And wow, there's Zeus and wow, she's being a bitch. What the fuck is going on? Like, it's it's much more right brain, artistic, 
just the the feelings and the emotions that are happening as you're reading it. Sure. Not necessarily the construction of this is a story that I am telling. Right. Well, and I think that when you said psychedelic, it kind of clicked into place because I'd forgotten that that was one of the main facets of this. And that, that kind of makes everything... That explains fucking everything about this. It's it's yeah. why I think you're right. I is I think you are supposed to feel slightly uncomfortable reading this. I think I I I I'm with you that like for me it's always with movies. I'll go and watch a movie and I'll kind of be like maybe this. Is that is that what they wanted me to think? Should I be thinking that? Maybe I should be thinking this whole other direction that I'm not thinking in right now. And that's why I like to talk about things with people is because I kind of, it's important to me to kind of view things from as many different aspects as possible, unless I hate them, in which case it's much harder to get me to do that. I mean, come on, I'm on the human. But um, I think the psychedelic nature of this is definitely, it is, it, it explains all, and those weren't really, so, despite all the things I've said, I don't really think that they're detriments to this book. No. I don't necessarily know where I stand with this book, and I don't think, I, I, I agree with you that I don't think that'll ever change. I don't, this is never going to be a book that I put down and go, wow, that was fucking fantastic. Right. You know, mm-hmm. this is going to be up there with shit like The Invisibles or The Filth, where I'm like, okay, I was definitely just a part of something. I'm not exactly sure what it was, although now we know with the Invisibles, it's uh, instructions on what to do when the six-dimensional aliens come and abduct us all. Don't spoil it. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's all right. They'll rewrite that out of your brain as soon as you hear it. It it sounds to me like your, your short version on this is, I'm all naked and sticky. Did I miss something fun? No, it's, it's, I'm all naked and and sticky. And why does the air taste purple? And also, what day is it? And who are you people? You're just going to totally neg out on my Futurama reference. I know I am not negging out on your Futurama reference. I'm sorry. I've been, uh. References aren't impressive. We covered this in the top 10 episode. (laughs) (laughs) References are impressive. Uh. But only when you include everybody. I'm moving past, that's true. I'm moving past the Futurama stage of my life and into the Rick and Morty stage of my life because I'm finally catching up on Rick and Morty. Good. You should. I think that that show is in some ways of a piece with this. I, yes. I've never watched it. Ah, uh, it's, it is fantastic. If you can get, parts, anyway, if you can okay. get past the parts that are awful, it's amazing. Excellent. Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so that's the thing. Yeah. Um, I love Wait. any, were shut you guys up, Joe. Over there, were you guys over there like conspiring and now you're going to just unleash? Hey, so here's the thing. Shut up. Just for a minute. Okay. I'll give awesome. you five okay, minutes. shut up because I want to talk about mouths. Mouth. Okay, which I, I hear think you is talk appropriate. About mouths. Okay, first off, I have to say I love any time Brant starts running his mouth on something uh, because it's fantastic, and thanks. I always, I always end up sitting there in in my own little haze of like, damn, that guy's got it, and it brings me to something else every time. So I just got to say that, like every time you go like that, Brant, like my my brain clicks over on a different gear and that's something i always appreciate when again when we're we're neglecting we were neglecting the psychedelic aspect of this um i i started again looking at the art in a different kind of way other than just our colors our kind of messy watery sort of images Mm -hmm. stars and nebulas and what have you um And I noticed something that I didn't notice my first read through when you were talking about Psychedelica. And I think it's kind of critical to how I look at this book. And it's mouths. And that sounds super weird. But as you kind of keep flipping around, there are so many panels that are just a mouth. Just a mouth. Something coming out of mouth. Something into it. A mouth speaking. And that's, I think, your Psychedelica right there is... You're kind of the art is doing the lotus eater for you. Uh, I'm I'm gonna and, actually expand on that and say not just mouths, but yeah. there's lots of 
circles and ovals? Yes. So I'm going to continue my thought. Yeah, go. All right. So here we go. So this thing that we have that Brandt pointed out of Psychedelica is something that we can we can look at this book as successful when we have that lens in front of our eyes. If we forget the Psychedelica, we forget like a core point of what this book is doing in narration and in art. If I don't pay attention to that aspect of how this book was written, I'm missing out on some of the decisions that were made. And I'm so glad that you said that because now I'm kind of looking at it and where I felt a little more negatively about the writing, I feel a lot more confident actually when I look at some of these things like these circular, lyrical, nebulous sort of ways of writing along with this art where it could be a push and pull for sure and it could be conflicting for sure, but it becomes, as you said, necessary. Yeah, I mean, don't forget that the Odyssey was written as a poem. It's got a cadence to mm-hmm. it, which is lost a little bit in the translation. But So I think there's an attempt to kind of capture some of that. Well, Psychedelica circles down a drain, too. As you pointed out, Toby, with these spherical sort of shapes, is that it should make some degree of sense that the direction for this book to go is round. That this, that this is something that must go around. And I don't know, um, we've, we've talked about um, House of Leaves before, but I'm thinking now about Only Revolutions by the same author, Mark Z. Danielewski, and how he wrote this book that the type was printed in the round, circular typography, for the specific reason of pulling you around in this, this drain, this sort of vortex. And after we see all these spheres on the page and spherical writing, if that makes any sense, these sort of sentences that start one way and then catch the point at the end and keep doing that, I feel like even if it's less accessible, that doesn't mean it's not successful. If the point of the, if it's successful, it should be disorienting. And that's what Brandt is kind of saying here, I think. I, I I do kind of want to expand on the, the the idea that was occurring to me as you were talking a little bit. And I'm looking at the end of chapter two. On the last three pages, we have uh, Odyssea walking through this circular hatchway into this tunnel leading into her ship. On the very next page, um, we have her uh, ship's girl in this circular hot tub. And then the page after that is the end where it's just this tunnel of white lines. Uh, And it reminded me of something that occurred to me very early on and then I completely blanked on. uh, And I want to just throw in the shape of the Odyssey as a ship. Yes, it's an incomplete circle. Well, it's an incredibly, there's a just massive amounts of vaginal imagery Mm -hmm. throughout this, passing through orifices, all of these circles and ovals and crescent shapes. Just throughout this book, over and over and over and over again, you're being presented with these same images. Yeah, which is funny because I was I saw the shape of that ship, and that was kind of the first thing, like, oh, it's it's vaginal. Yeah, like, it, and all these other things are too. Like the doorways are vaginal, and or mouths. Um, yeah, and then it kind of struck me that if you look at shapes like how we store things, the doors that we have, you could loosely say that they are shaped like a penis. And so like I was thinking of ships that we have in a lot of sci-fi where they usually are thrusting forward and are shaped in a way that is invocative. To penetrate. To penetrate (laughs) They're incredibly phallic. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and so I, I thought that was interesting and I'm glad Brent that you had brought up the point of the psychedelic because that was something I think there's something I tend to struggle with. I know we did, uh, what comic was it? Changes? Something like that. Yeah. And, uh, I had a really hard time with that just because, you know, psychedelic just really isn't my cup of tea. Well, I think that there's a Um, difference between psychedelic and just fucking obscure. Yeah. But yeah. Um, but anyway. Um so so in this case, 
it definitely helps with that understanding in that it's, well, you're not really supposed to maybe understand it as a linear concept. It's more about how you feel, what it makes you feel, that feeling that you get while you're thinking about it afterwards. Um, you but <laughs> Yeah, not, not even. Like, I normally when we record, I don't necessarily tell a bunch of people at work what we're recording i might mention to manix or something like oh yeah we're you know we're recording this thing or that thing um i could not stop talking about the odyssey today or odyssey whatever uh today odyssey odyssey uh <laughs> odyssey. no i and i kept asking people like oh ha- have you read it and most people were saying no uh i know i talked to <clears throat> talked to Allison and she said that she opened it, looked at the art, looked at the text and went, nah, like that's too much, too much going on for a day like today. This we will come back to. Um, but yeah, so I think it's definitely successful and it's, it's like I keep reinstating and I want to make sure that this is, that this point is made. I don't think that this is a bad book by any stretch of the imagination. There are just things that I, I don't know, that I take umbrage to, I guess. Mm-hmm. And whether or not that's the book's fault is still up for debate, I guess. Well, I, I want to take another jump back to another point that you made, Brant, um, thinking on that. We've got two male authors writing this book that, as you pointed out, well, you know, let's make it all with women that happen to, again, exemplify various supposedly masculine ideals what do we make of that what do we make of two male authors writing the odyssey with this question of gender in there i'm really curious about so that. from my perspective i think the challenge this book would have depending on the audience is that of course you'll have a couple of different strains of philosophy that could approach this right certain the kind of the I think it's fourth wave feminism now, would argue that there are no such thing as gender roles, so having a bunch of women who are displaying aggression and everything else is just as likely and appropriate within a, within a purely environmental context. Like, there's nothing wrong with that. Like, that's, that is and can be, and there shouldn't be any reason to think otherwise. It's, in fact, you would be projecting, or in this case, I would be projecting my own lack of understanding of the societal role and gender roles by saying that those are masculine traits they are aggression they are war they are these things either sex is capable of them and should be equally capable of them right but then i think you get into trans theory and some other ones which actually say that there is kind of a combination of social and um, physiological factors right like all of the male gods or the traditionally male gods are presented as sort of transgendered almost right they have a mixture of feminine and masculine characteristics or traditionally feminine and masculine characteristics so i think that there i think that some of this and this is why i think the book is meant to be discordant is your own baggage will also impact to what extent you interpret some of the imagery and the concepts within it more broadly speaking i mean there is a very robust uh, argument going about whether or not artists can create art about experiences they are not capable of having Mm -hmm. and whether or not that's valid or appropriate. And I think that this book will just be another piece to insert into that conversation and have to chew on that. I, I question male and female coding of behaviors in this book too. I have to sort of question that. Um, in particular, um, the the Sebic situa- or situation leaving her in, in this pool and everything after asking these supposedly very feminized questions about creating family and things like that. And then further followed up by leaving the ship's women who are stereotypically in our culture perceived as more feminine or more mm, fertile, I guess. Uh, you know, what we perceive as fertility in their bodies, why we leave them alone, why, why we leave them behind. Why do we keep leaving these types of women behind in this narrative that is supposedly meant to be driven by a more feminine energy? Why is that a thing? 
That's something I kept asking myself looking at this going, why is it that the more socially feminine, I'm going to use that kind of loosely, mm -hmm. is continually being left out of the story in favor of a socially masculine behavior and adventure story. I got to wonder about that. I really got to wonder about that when we've got, uh, yes, it's the Odyssey, but we've got two men writing female coded story with female characters in the context of the Odyssey. What degree of reimagining are you actually doing? Well, in the, uh, oh, sorry, Kayla, go ahead. Um, one of the things I, I wanted to talk about, um, I have in my notes, is that it, this story in particular sometimes highlights that over-the-top feminism that we, I think, as a society, have generally kind of decided, like, now nah, that shit's not okay. Um, but it highlights that type of feminism as a reasonable action. And it frequently, I think, is done in a way that will kind of highlight, like, how shitty um women were treated in the odyssey but it's hard because it, they just pretended like they flipped gender roles but didn't really it seems okay can we can we pause for a second here yeah welcome back everybody uh sorry for the interruption uh we're going to try to kind of wrap things up as much as we can and then move on to recommendations so Kaylee, did you want to kind of finish the thought that you were having? So re resuming my discussion as if we never stopped. I feel like this book in many ways highlights the negative points of feminism, like the, the straw feminism that people like to pull up as an example of why feminism is bad. That sort of... Uh, men hating pro free bleeding feminism that doesn't really exist in the world but certain people like to pretend that it does um and i feel like this book highlights a lot of that and as i was reading it at first i was really uncomfortable with that idea um the idea of he the the helena or Hel helen of troy equivalent um being dragged about in like a gimp suit and having his face cut up things mm -hmm. like that uh, it was really uncomfortable and then i sort of realized that that was a lot of how women were treated in these stories like in the odyssey uh, women were left behind women were disfigured uh for these supposed crimes of running away of being non-compliant things like that um and i want to feel like that was intentional my fear is that it might not have been but i feel like given who fractions first and foremost editor is and, and by that i mean his wife i can't imagine that it was that anything in this story is not done with intention yeah, and that's that's kind of how I feel about this as well. Um, there are other collaborators, however, and I worry that that might might have slipped notice. But I guess it is a lot of how the reader perceives it as well. So it's a matter of did a reader perceive this as that sort of negative feminism? Are they going to step away from this and go, "Oh, that's what feminism is," and have like this bad taste in their mouth, or? Will they see it as that sort of, this is how women were treated. We are flipping the narrative 100%. And so the good and the bad gets included. Well, even if you were doing that intentionally, and even if it was the idea that you were flipping the book on that, you're still not. That's the thing, is that this isn't one of those cases, like, again, where people will be like, oh, that's reverse, you know reverse racism or things like that. It does not work that way. Even if you're intending to have it be similar to these things that happened in the story before, you cannot have it that way. Because the difference is women lived in positions of oppression. Men do not. So I, I look at that and I go, I'm not really sure if your point is going to come across effectively 
because you're already starting at a point where you don't really understand what that means, or at least you're not accurately communicating what that would really mean. And in science fiction, we have a lot of like what if premises. That's basically what drives most of it. But I don't think that that exempts you from the responsibility that you have to the world that you're in when you put material like this out. And the sort of reactions that people may have to that needs to be part of the equation when you make a decision like that. So I, I kind of agree with you that like I could see where someone could try to be going that direction with this, but I neglect to see how that could be done successfully given that knowledge that you really can't just flip the book on an issue like this. Yeah. So, you know, thousands of years, kind of a precedent. <laughs> so. I, I know I absolutely agree with you, but I think that this is a work that is a de- is demanding enough of its audience that while well, you are going to have those people that just look at the surface detail and just see like, oh, it's a dude being led around in a gimp suit by three women and they don't get it. I think anybody that actually takes the time to appreciate this work and really think about what it means is going to get that because the kind of the level of thought that you have to give a work like this to really appreciate it necessitates that kind of thought. That may be true, but it operates under huge degrees of assumption. I suppose that's that's true. Just assuming that people are going to think of it that way, again, doesn't exempt you from the responsibility that you would have in making sure that you communicate that clearly and effectively. Because there are people who are going to pick up this book and be like, ah, science fiction, ah. You don't have to lead people by the nose, but you do have to take responsibility for how you present material. Yeah, that's something I worry about. I totally agree. Did did you have something else that you wanted to add, Joe? Well, I just, I I think my, uh, the, the thing that kind of gets me about that is just, I find myself wondering, it was the one thing that I, I wondered why, what was the reason for this choice? Mm -hmm. Are you trying to make a statement about the treatment of women and classics? Are you trying to make a statement about women being oppressed? Are you trying to like, are you doing it because you think it will further and like embellish uh, the, the psychedelia, you know, like what, what exactly is your reason for, for the gender swap? And, I think um, for me, the, you know, Brandt had mentioned the hyper aggressive women. And I, ne- I don't really feel at any point that we were getting into the man in a dress thing. I felt that these were, you know, it's like this is a war story in essence. You have to have. And I felt that they, I felt that during the Cyclops part, this, uh, they, that was done well. They felt regimented. It didn't feel like, oh, I'm going to fucking rah, blood and guts and shit. It felt like we're soldiers. We're going to deal with this like soldiers. It it's, wasn't 300. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, it it wasn't didn't feel aggro. like hyper masculine, yeah. but like these are warriors. These are women that have seen war and they are going to treat this as an enemy and they're going to deal with it as an army does. But I agree that there were some parts that I'm kind of like, was this, you know, just because you have an intent when you when you make a work doesn't necessarily mean that your intent will be well conveyed by that work. And I agree with Kit that the responsibility lies with you as the creator to kind of make sure that your intention is, um, is clear or, f- you know, face the repercussions of people that don't get it or that are saying, hey, I may have gotten this, but, you know... You have to be more clear about that. Yeah, mm-hmm. absolutely. So did we have anything else that we really wanted to say about this work before yeah. we wrap up? Um, one thought I, you know, between the days of recording, I was kind of flipping this over in my head, trying to figure out why it didn't quite work for me. Mm-hmm. And um, as Brant pointed out, this is a psychedelic work. So it is a lot about how it makes you feel, what it makes you think about, not necessarily the story. And that's fine. It's not necessarily my cup of tea, but I get it. And I can appreciate psychedelic works for what they do and what they accomplish. The problem I have, I think, with this is that you can't take an already established story, something that we know just as a part of our common culture, and then go, well, the story doesn't matter. 
which is why I'm adapting it. And it's like, but that doesn't really work because this is a story. It has a beginning and a middle and an end. And you can't just kind of cast that aside and go, well, now it's psychedelic. So it's different. Like yeah. the certain points still need to be hit in order for it to be a complete adaptation. Or a new story needs to be created using the original story as inspiration. And, and that's kind of, I feel like, where I came into the conversation at the beginning of the episode saying that there's something, something that doesn't quite work with this story on a fundamental level um, in regard to th the adaptation that you're taking it from the time and a place and a society in ancient Greece and you're exporting that into the future in outer space in this much more matriarchal society and that there are no men and it doesn't quite all gel mm -hmm. you know and and maybe down the line like he, they're they're just gonna really hit that groove really hard and it's all gonna come together but right here right now at the end of volume one it doesn't quite gel at yeah. least for me i'm with you i think that i, I as with most really like um what's the word i want to use um this was i think this is a bold move by somebody that i consider to be a talented writer but regardless of how talented you are uh you know taking chances sometimes you know it's always a gamble it's and uh i don't necessarily think that uh, i think he missed the mark a little bit on this but you know i'm not gonna i'll be interested to look you know, I might look in at it in a year or two and see, or if it wraps up, I might try and give it another shot. But, you know, I appreciate, and I, I think what it kind of impresses me about it is that Matt Fraction, who is somebody that is well-known in the comics community, rather than doing the same shit over and over again, he did this. And that's kind of cool to me, is that, like, you could have done just about anything, mm. and what you did was a psychedelic imagining of the Odyssey. That's cool. That's you know, even if it doesn't work, it it kind of I think I still have a lot of respect for the man because it it was like, you know, it was a it was a it it was a ballsy thing to try. Sometimes you make reindeer games. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> Sometimes you make paycheck. You know. <sighs> All right. Well, if if we don't have. Anything else? Uh, we can move on to recommendations. Okay. All right, Joe, would you like to start us off? Yeah, I think um, I'm gonna. So because we've moved, I'm going to actually recommend the thing that I originally wanted to recommend, which is Injection by Warren Ellis and Declan Shelvey. Shel 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 Declan Shelvey. Shelvey with uh, colors by. I fucked uh, that up so badly the last time. <laughs> Jilvey, uh, Did I fuck it up again? Kid is laughing at me. No. But the correction to me! It can only be correct, I'm uh, sure. Um, <laughs> with no, I, uh, I'm Colors by Jordi willing, Belair. Yeah, I'm perfectly willing to admit that I fucked it up again. I, <laughs> no, I've got no idea. Okay. I'm just, Man, I have a five-letter last name that nobody can spell right, I think. Pretty. That, uh, yeah, yeah it's exactly. P-R-E-T-T-Y. So, yeah, exactly. -E -T -T so, or pretty. say right, so whatever. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, um, uh, Injection. Injection is like the love child. If Global Frequency and Planetary got together and made sweet, sweet love and had a baby, that baby would be Injection. And <laughs> I love everything about it. It's basically... <laughs> Uh, a spy, um, a, uh, a coder, a computer coder. I refuse to use the term hacker because this is not 1997. Get the hack the um, mainframe. A yeah. scientist, a, uh, oh, what are they called? A cunning man or like a, a hedge wizard. A hedge wizard, pretty much. And um, fucking. A Sherlock Holmes analog pretty much come together to make sure that the 21st century is not completely devoid of any kind of innovation. And they create this thing that they set free on the internet, and this thing starts fucking with them. A cyber ghost god that changes the future. Yeah, it's just, it is Warren Ellis in all his splendor. Uh, it's a feast for the eyes. It's absolutely beautiful, but for me, it's it feels like the beginning of something that could be very, very good. 
Yeah. And I'm really excited for it. I'm, I'm pitching the first five issues, which comprise the first arc. Cool. And uh, I'm, yeah, I, I think it's really good. I feel like it's out in trade now. Yes, it is. five issues. Yes. So yeah, volume one. Yeah. All right, cool. Kaylee? Um, I'm bringing back a book that I have pitched before, and I think it is a fantastic work, and it's a lot of fun to read. Um, it is Princeless by nice. Jeremy Whitley, M. Goodwin, Jung Ha Kim, and Dave Dwanch. Uh, it is about a princess who doesn't want to be locked up in her tower, defended by a dragon waiting for somebody to save her. And she tells her parents this after her four or no, three older sisters have all met the same fate. Um, she tells her parents, I do not want this. I, I refuse. You can't make me. They end up drugging her and she wakes up on her 16th birthday, finds herself locked in a tower with a dragon defending her. Uh, she gets pissed and she rides the dragon to save her sisters and starts she, she runs away yeah well she's in a tower she starts uh saving all the other princesses and she meets uh, a dwarf she meets who like makes fantastic armor she meets a, a pr- like an asshole prince that was going to save somebody else and kind of makes him her enemy um it's just a ton of fun and it's a lot of flipping that traditional narrative in a non-psychedelic way um and it's it's a fantastic read and the art is gorgeous cool kaylee's got no chill mm. <laughs> kit <laughs> all right so um i'm pitching kill shakespeare um basically this is an image book that is about uh shakespeare as a sweet ass wizard and um he's got his good characters like uh hamlet and others trying to find him while some of his evil characters, um, or somewhat evil, like Lady Macbeth, are trying to find him to kill him. And so it's about hunting down the Shakespeare wizard. Um, The art is beautiful, bright, clear, and distinct, things that I like. Um, It's only really two trades that I want to deal with on this one. And uh, I think it would be a lot of fun because we just read the Odyssey. Why not screw around with Shakespeare? You had me at wizard. All right. You had me at ass wizard. Um, Ass wizards. (laughs) So I'm also pitching an image book uh, and I am pitching a sci-fi Western called Drifter by Ivan Brandon and Nick Klein. Uh, And since this book's a little bit weird... In a non-psychedelic way, uh, I'm just going to read the description from the back of the book. <laughs> Abram Pollux barely survives a crash, crash landing on Oro, a lawless backwater world where life is cheap. After miraculously surviving not only the crash, but also a one-sided gunfight, Pollux finds himself in a ramshackle town filled with other survivors shipwrecked on this strange, barren world. There he meets Marshall Lee Carter, an earnest woman giving her all to maintain order. A grizzled preacher, convinced that Pollux's coming is a sign from God, and Emmerich Bell, the man who shot him down not moments after he dragged his body from the wreckage of his ship. Uh, and so this is basically a Western in all ways except setting. It is a Western that just happens to take place on an alien world. And it's it's very low down and gritty and Everyone is damaged in one way or another, and they're dealing with their problems in the least positive way possible, which is living out in the ass end of nowhere on this really strange alien world filled with alien creatures doing alien things for alien purposes. Um, It's got really vibrant art, and I'm really interested to see where it's going because there's a lot of really twisted plot lines going on, not least of which is what exactly happened to Abram that caused his ship to crash and in the lost time that he has after that, because he doesn't remember what happened. So it's really cool. It's a lot of fun. The first two volumes are out, which covers the first nine issues, and that is Drifter. So Joe, what would you like to read? Uh, I don't know. I like wizards, but I like (laughs) westerns. I like princesses too. 
Uh, what about princeless princesses? I'm a big fan of those. Princesses. <laughs> I saw Disney princesses reimagined as orange boxes the other day. It was amazing. I, I actually have, um, I guess, uh, Nintendo mm-hmm. princesses as badass Final Fantasy sword wielders well, on my yeah. wall. Um, I'm come back to me. I'm thinking about Good. it. Maybe Damn I can. It. No. Maybe I can break a tie. All right, Kaylee. I am all about Shakespeare, and I just love that man, that bisexual man. <laughs> I'm going to go with Kill Shakespeare. Bisexual Get? high fives. Yeah. Um, no, but um, yeah, I think it's about fucking time. We talked about Princeless, and I have all those books at my house, so that's easy and convenient for me. So, Princeless, fucking time. All right. Well, um, how long is Princeless? It's pretty short. Okay, I, I'm About gonna vote. Thick. I'm gonna vote for that simply on the auspice that, given that we're recording on a later date, we have a little bit less time to finish reading everything for next episode. Uh, so my vote is for Princeless, but I desperately want you to bring back Word Wizards. I ain't wizards, doing it. Never again. Never again. Never again. Never again. No. No, I'm totally going um, back. Because, okay, so because everything is said, I'll, I will vote for Drifter because it doesn't matter. But I, also, <laughs> I really want to talk about Ejection, <laughs> too, because, oh, my shit. God. That I actually really want to talk about Drifter, but I think that we've skipped Princeless enough times, and I honestly really want to read it. Does it so. really have the next Redemption pick? No, She's, Cade uh, has the next. Oh, no, and I already know what I'm pitching because y'all won't talk about women prisoners. Fuck. Yeah. Talk Which, about women, you patriarchal assholes. They talk about women. Asriarchal patriarchals. Yeah. <laughs> Asriarchy. Now that's a system I can get behind. <laughs> get it? But I'm behind. Get, <laughs> get, get okay. behind. Yeah. Leaving. Ladies need to stop. Put, peaking all of the microphones forever. That's Wait, reverse uh, sexism. Yeah, yeah. Joe does no it fun. all the time. Mm-hmm. Yep. Rude. I have privilege. Mm. When you guys have been mm-hmm. on the show for four fucking years, then you can peek the microphones whenever you want. Literally, no one can stop him. He overpowered us. You mean when us. we have a penis, we can peek the microphones whenever we want. I don't know. I think actually peak your voice phones. is much higher than mine. I think you'd have a much easier time peeking the microphone. Anyway, <laughs> we will be reading Princeless for the next episode. Mm hmm. And thank you all for listening, despite the many, many the, obstacles the that presented races. themselves this week. Peeing on so, microphones. We love you all, and <laughs> we will see you next time. This has been a production of View from the Gutters. We hope you'll join us next time for discussion of our selected title. In the meantime, we encourage you to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Tumblr. Become a sponsor of the show at patreon.com slash viewfromthegutters or leave us a review on iTunes, as it does help new listeners find the show. We encourage you to send any questions, comments, or recommendations you may have to contact at viewfromthegutters.com. Thank you for listening, and as always, keep reading. What we didn't tell you is we've been recording straight through since Wednesday, so this is going to be like our longest episode ever, clocking in it like three and a half days. No, mm-hmm. I edited it. Oh. Well, shit. You know, I look like an asshole. <laughs> yep. Extra Patreon tier. Three days <laughs> worth of fucking Three days of silence. Aisha walking around <laughs> on tables. And Toby going, Adam, did you see where I put... Aisha, get down from there. <laughs> yes. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Uh, Good night, right. everybody. Good night.